Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Hopefully you're in the right room. We're here to talk about Swift, uh, which, as the subtitle suggests, is, is a mobile language which is being expanded into new and exciting opportunities. Um, just a very brief background. Uh, my name's Ian Partridge. I work for IBM um, as part of the Swift at IBM team. Um, my, my background is, is in runtime systems. I, I worked for a long time uh, on the development and support team for IBM's Java Virtual Machine. Uh, I was one of the authors of the garbage collector in the IBM Virtual Machine. Um, my parents were always thrilled that I was working on the garbage collection team. It sounded so glamorous. Uh, <laughs> um, but for recently, I've, I've moved over and I'm now I'm working on Swift, which is a new language and a new opportunity. Um, you can catch me on Twitter or, or GitHub and see what me and the team are up to there. Um, if you've got any feedback from the talk afterwards, please do tweet me and let me know. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about Swift, wh what it is, where it's come from, where it might be going in the future. Um, so a bit of the history of how we got to this point. Then we're going to talk about the Swift language itself. This is kind of going to be a bit of a language 101 for people who've never seen Swift before to kind of give you the, the basics and a flavor of, of ha how the language looks and how it works. Um, and then we're going to talk about the work that's going on to bring Swift to new places, uh, mainly the server side. So what it takes to bring a new language to the server um, from, from a completely different background. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what you need to do that and um, also a bit about the web framework which we're developing inside IBM in Swift. Um, so what's Swift? It's a new programming language designed by Apple to be the future of iOS and macOS development. So um, I can see a lot of people with Apple hardware in the room. Um, for the last 20 plus years, if you were developing applications for macOS or more recently for iOS, tvOS, watchOS, you would have been doing that in Objective-C. Um, but Apple are engaged in a huge migration effort to move that developer community from Objective-C to Swift. And that, that, that has been ongoing for a number of years now, and that, that, that migration is still happening. Swift is a general purpose systems programming language. It's designed to be a replacement for Objective-C, obviously, but also for languages like C and C++. So it's a compiled language. Um, the three bullet points that, that people mainly associated with it are that it's safe, fast, and expressive. And I'll talk a little bit about now about what each of those kind of means and why why you might use them. So why is it? A, why do people describe it as a safe language? Um, well, firstly, it's a type safe language. So everything in your program has a defined type, unlike uh, languages like JavaScript, which are dynamically typed. But it does have type inference, so uh, you can avoid a lot of the kind of unnecessary keystrokes that you get in languages like Java, where you're constantly having to teach the compiler over and over again what the type is that you're talking about. Um, it's also safe because it solves a whole category of problems which are kind of well known that C and C++ have been dogged with. So, uh, for example, in C and C++, you don't have to initialize your variables. And if you don't, their contents are undefined. Well, you have to in Swift. The, all your variables have definitive initialization. It has immutability as a core language feature. And what I mean by that is um, that when it's just as easy to define something as a constant as a non-constant. And, and in many ways, defining things as constants is, is, the, is the right way to do things. It has no implicit type conversions. If you want to go from a 64-bit to a 32-bit int or vice versa, uh, or you want to convert between an int or a string, you have to. There's nothing comes for free. You have to. S you have to say where you're going from, and where you're going to, and that forces you to think at programming time about these things. So issues like integer overflows, um, type conversion errors, all those things are designed out of, have been designed out of the language. And the final one is kind of strange: is that objects cannot be null. Um, when we're kind of used in languages like Java, that if you have an object and you don't want to refer to it anymore, you can just set that reference to nil or null. 
Um, in Swift, you, in Swift, you can't do that. Everything, all the reference, every reference has to point to an object at all times, uh, unless you use a specific language feature called optionals, which I'll talk about later. And of course, the consequence of this is if something can't be null, you can never have a null pointer exception. <laughs> so that kind of designs that problem out of the language. Um, but of course, sometimes you need something to be null, and there's there's a way to do that, which I'll show. So the syntax, which I'll get to in a minute, is is broadly inspired by the C family of languages. So if you know Java or you know JavaScript or uh, you uh, have come of, have worked in some of these other languages with that kind of heritage, you'll feel at home. It's not wacky and out there. Um, but at the same time, it has a lot of modern features which are more commonly known from scripting languages like Ruby and Python. Um, it has features like generics. It has closures, aka lambdas. Uh, it has tuples, which we'll look at, um, and it also supports some functional programming ideas. Things like map, filter, reduce come baked into the standard library, uh, ready for you to use. So if you're a fan of functional style programming, you can do that in Swift as well. And the, the third bullet point was fast. Um, it's fast because it's a compiled native language. So when you run the Swift compiler, you're not generating some bytecode, which is then going to be interpreted and possibly jitted. You're, it's compiled directly down to machine code, and it's built on top of the LLVM optimizing compiler, which is an existing open source project, which has produced, amongst other things, the Clang C compiler. Um, it's also fast because there's no GC pauses. Um, those of us who've worked in Java for a long time have spent many, many hours tuning our garbage collectors to eke out another one hundredth of a second on each pause time. Um, I, know, I know I made a career of it for a while. <laughs> um, but what it So it doesn't have a garbage collector, but what it does have is something called automatic reference counting. So in, in, an, in an ARC scheme, every object in your program has a number associated with it, which is the number of times that object is referred to. So the number of pointers to the object. So every time a new reference is created to the object, that number is incremented and when the reference is broken, it's decremented by the system automatically. And of course, when the number drops to zero, that means the object's no longer referred to, so it can be freed. Uh, the, the, the problem with these kind of systems is when you have two objects which refer to each other, because then both of them have a reference count of one, but technically, if there's nothing else coming from outside, then they could be collected. That's called a reference cycle, and there's syntax in the language for working around that. Um, it also has concurrency, so it supports multi-core hardware. Um, there's a framework called Grand Central Dispatch, which I'll run through the basics of later, uh, which lets you uh, have run parallel programs. So what's the timeline? Um, we don't know exactly when Swift kind of began, but we can make a guess. Um, uh, guess is around 2010 when it started on someone's laptop inside, out inside Apple. Um, but th it was kind of revealed to the world two years ago. Uh, WWDC is Apple's annual developer conference, as many of you will know. Um, it was June 2014 when they revealed that they'd been working on this language, and they released at that point a beta of Swift 1. And since then, it's been kind of going on a yearly cadence. So at each uh, successive WWDC, there's been a new beta with the GA later on in the year, uh, coincidental with... A a release of iOS. But the really interesting thing happened last December, um, and that's when um, Apple open sourced Swift on GitHub. They'd announced they were going to do that at WWDC, but their code finally landed on, I think it was December the 4th last year. Um, and that's when a lot of other people got interested, because until this point, uh, Swift had been interesting technology, but closed close source proprietary uh, entirely limited to Apple's ecosystem of devices. Um, as soon as it was open sourced on GitHub, uh, there were new opportunities. So the main Swift website is swift.org, um, and the code is all on GitHub slash Apple slash Swift. Um, I said we thought it started in 2010. Well, the reason is because they op actually open sourced the entire repo history at that time. So it came with a history of tens of thousands of commits and the first one of those was in 2010, so you can really do some software archaeology if you if you want to do that. Um, that number there is out of date. Um, 
it's well over 40,000 commits on the open source project now and uh, more landing by the hour. It's one of the most active projects on GitHub. And the reason Apple put it on GitHub, I think, is because they wanted to build an open developer community around it. Um, and certainly I found and we found in IBM that uh, it's it's been really good working in open source. Um, Apple have uh, even recently started guaranteeing commit access to their repos to community contributors. Um, so there's just a few smatterings of comments and feedback on GitHub, which has been really great to see. And of course, um, one of the things about open sourcing something is people can take it in directions you might not have anticipated. So yes, you can now build the Swift compiler for Android, um, and you can uh, you can call your Swift code from inside an Android application if that's what you want to do. Um, no user interface compatibility between the two. Um, there's a actually mentioned, uh, oh, you can't see the bottom there. There's a link there. I'll, I'll put the slides on speaker deck afterwards. If you follow me on Twitter, you can get them. Um, but GitHub Satellite was a conference early this year where GitHub spoke about the work that's been going on in open source with Swift, how fast the innovation has been happening. And uh, so there's a, there's a talk, with, uh, I'll put a YouTube link there, which is worth watching. And, and this is kind of what's happened. Um, so to explain, what you're looking at here. on You've got two graphs, obviously two plots, s separated by two years. So third quarter 2014 and third quarter 2016. And what we've got on the x-axis is popularity rank by number of GitHub projects. And on the y-axis, we've got uh, popularity rank by number of Stack Overflow questions, which is kind of an interesting thing to plot for a whole bunch of different languages and see how that changes over time. So you can see that back in 2014, two years ago, um, there wasn't much code on GitHub. We're pretty much on the left-hand side of the chart. But there, people are asking a lot of questions about Swift. It was a brand new language, only just been announced. And, and over the last two years, Swift has drifted top right up towards, up towards the top right there. And you can see now there's lots of code on GitHub and still even more questions and answers being generated on Stack Overflow. So. Uh, Swift is rapidly approaching languages l like Scala, Perl. Uh, you can see Ruby's up there. Um, the, the 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 big the big languages. Um, also worth mentioning that when it was open sourced, it was open sourced under the Apache license version two, which, as you may know, is one of the most popular open source language open source licenses. Um, so that provides kind of the reassurance that the community needs. Um, and also that companies need uh, that this is this is something they could get involved with uh, from a legal point of view. Um, I mentioned earlier that Swift's built on top of the LLVM compiler infrastructure, um, but that's not the only existing open source project that's being used. Um, like pretty much all software nowadays, Swift is kind of building on the shoulders of the giants that people have gone before. So as well as the LLVM compiler infrastructure, which is underlying the Swift compiler, you've also got things like it uses libxml for XML, uh, it uses ICU for Unicode, the build system has CMake, and um, they use Python to auto-generate code. So um, uh, Swift itself is, is building on solid foundations. So if you go to swift.org and you download Swift, what do you get? You get a compiler, obviously, which will take your Swift code and generate a binary. Uh, it also has a REPL. That's uh, read, evaluate, print loop, um, which is kind of surprising because REPLs tend to be more associated with scripting type languages, um, but they've managed to create a REPL for Swift as well. So you can so you can use that if you want to. There's a debugger, which is a customized version of LLDB, the low level debugger. Uh, you can do unit testing through a framework called XCTest. As I mentioned earlier, there's support for multi-core hardware through a concurrency library known as libdispatch. And also there's the standard library and the foundation, which are basically equivalent to what you might call a class library, that kind of thing. Um, and finally, um, new in Swift 3, there's a package manager, which aims to help people to uh, obviously package, bundle up their code, uh, manage the dependencies between those. Um, that's still under active development, but was released um, earlier this year with Swift 3.
the language is evolving still. Um, so each major release of Swift from 1 to 2 to 3 has been a major source breaking change. Um, language compatibility is now a goal going forward, but up until now that it hasn't been the case. Um, but one, th uh, one thing that's happened since it's been open sourced is that how the language itself evolves has been part of the open source project. So there's a separate repo on GitHub called Swift Evolution, which is where people are proposing pull requests and uh, writing proposals about how they think the language should be changed. And in the Swift 3 timeframe, a lot of those proposals came from the community, uh, not just from within Apple. Um, there's also a, an extremely high traffic mailing list, which you can subscribe to if, you're a, if you want to receive hundreds of emails a month all about how a language is, might change or might not change. Okay, so that's kind of a little bit about the project and where it's come from and where it is. But but why why is it why is it interesting at all? Um, and to do that, I just want to talk briefly about some of the performance characteristics of Swift. So here we've got a graph with a whole bunch of different languages along the bottom, and each of these languages is implementing the same algorithm. So we've uh, this is a benchmark known as N body. It's a kind of it's. It's what it what it does isn't particularly interesting, but but the point is it's a compute benchmark which is CPU bound. Um, so you can see that different languages take different amounts of time to uh, run the same algorithm. And in fact, some of those ones on the right hand side have been chopped off because they took longer than 100 seconds. Um, so you've got a wide vari variation in performance there, um, but Swift stacks up pretty well in the in the kind of middle of the pack type type range. So that's looking at how long it took to do something, um, but as well as how long it took, it's also interesting to see how much memory was it taking to, to do that work. So here's the same list of languages, but this time sorted by how much memory they were using. Uh, so you can see that the JVM-based languages in the middle tend to por perform particularly poorly, and that's kind of unsurprising because we know that if you want to really get screaming performance out of Java, you have to make sure that you've got a Java heap big enough not just to contain your workload, but to give you a headroom on top as well. Um, but th these modern native languages down on the bottom left, Go, Swift, and Rust, perform really well um, in terms of memory usage. So we've looked at duration and we've looked at memory usage. Let's combine the two and kind of divide them and look at kind of duration by memory. So this is almost like seconds per megabyte or whatever you want to call it. Um, and you can see here that when you when you looking at the two combined, Swift starts to look really attractive. Um, now you might you might wonder, well, okay, why is this interesting? Um, it's interesting because of of this, um, which is how workloads tend to be built in the cloud. You tend to be built by how much memory you're using for how long. Um, gigabytes per hour is is really matters nowadays with cloud workloads and when you've got something like Swift which is very competitive in those kind of measurements that can mean real money oh that hasn't worked so here's how you do hello world in Swift um, we're just going to do a quick tour through the language uh, that's what hello world looks like and that's how you define a string. You say let, the keyword let means you're defining a constant. So I'd say that's devox, and then you say hello, and then the, the backslash syntax is how you kind of do string interpolation, so inserting one string into another. Um, so let was for doing a constant, which means that if I then tried to assign that to something or somewhere else, that would be an error, and we that would be a compile time error as well. Uh, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier about Swift uh, prioritizing safety as a language feature. So if you wanted to be able to change your variable, you would use a var instead. So um, there we go, DevOps UK this time, if you were going to a different event. Um, control flow. So here's how you define an array. Uh, you say an array let expense costs with, then you've got three doubles inside that array. Note that I haven't said what the type of the array is. So um, this is an example of the type inference in the language. So it would note the compiler would notice that I've got three doubles in the array, therefore it must be an array of double. And I didn't have to say that. 
But on the second line where it says sum double equals zero, I've told the compiler what the type is because if I hadn't, it would assume it was an integer because I'd said zero, not 0, 0. 0.0. And then for each of those, we can iterate over them with a for in loop, add them up and print the result out. Uh, it has switch statements, obviously. So here we've got a constant string of vanilla and we're going to switch on that. Um, so depending on what the string is set to, you can print out various different things. Um, a few nice little things, you can match two cases on the same line by s putting a comma between them. Um, and you can also put kind of code inside there as well. So case let str where str has prefix mint, that's saying if the, if the string starts with prefix mint, then we will assign it to this local variable called str, and then we can print that out using the string interpolation. Um, default at the bottom, you have to have a default case statement. They are required, even if it does nothing just kind of to force you to think about that possibility. So I said that object references could, might or can never be null and that there was a feature to kind of allow that to happen if you want it to happen. Uh, that feature is known as optionals and it's one of the really kind of interesting features of the language. There was an optional type introduced into Java in Java 8 but um, that was kind of bolted onto the side as a, as a new package optionals in Swift are a core feature of the language itself. So you can see I'm defining a variable called name which is an optional string. So when it says string question mark that means this it's an optional string um, which means it is that variable is allowed to be nil. And then I, the if let statement does an assignment which basically says if name is not nil then assign it to valid name else we would print out anonymous. Um, so that, that's known as optional unwrapping. Um, the next thing, let's say we've got a string which is set to 42, and then we're going to uh, want to convert that n that string to an integer. Uh, in that case, you can call the initializer on integer, passing in your string. Um, but because that could fail, for example, if the string wasn't 42, but it was ABC, and that's not an integer, uh, that 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 uh, initializer on integer actually returns an optional integer. So then, if you want to check whether the conversion succeeded or failed, you would check whether the number you got back was nil or not. If that makes sense. And uh, just a way that you can simplify that, you can do the whole thing on one line. So you can say if let num equals instra, and then it succeeded or it failed which is kind of nice. One of the downsides about optionals though is if you're if something can be optional that means you'll be constantly checking whether or not it is optional or not and and you can end up with what's known as kind of a pyramid of doom where your code gradually drifts to the right hand side of your editor. Um, there's an example of that at the top so let's say you have an optional you're going to check it and then once you've unwrapped it um, exclamation mark is a kind of force unwrap saying I know I'm guaranteeing that this is not nil at this point um, so you can kind of unwrap one then unwrap another and drift to the right hand side of the page um, instead of doing that you can use what's known as optional chaining which is to put a question mark in the middle of the chain of things that you're, un you're dereferencing so what this means is in in the second section here is if my optional was nil uh, the assignment would bail out at that point without even looking at another op optional, um, which means you can you can chain these things together and make your code more readable. Right. So Swift has functions. So here's a function which takes two parameters, a and b, both of which are integers, and returns an integer. So the return type goes on the right hand side after the little arrow sign. So this function just adds the two up together. And the way that you would call that function is to say add ins a and then b. So you actually pass the name of the parameter when you do the function call, which is unusual um, or certainly different to how Java works. Um, so what if you didn't want to have to pass those names? In that case, you would put an underscore at the start. So functions kind of have two different, function parameters have two different names. There's an internal name, in this case A, and an external name, in this case underscore or you don't have to provide it. 
So in that case, you could call addins13, which would look a lot more familiar. So you can make a decision for each of your parameters whether you want your user to have to provide the name or not. Why is this a good thing? Well, because it lets you do things like this. So here we've got a function called move, which we're defining. And you can say things like move from start to end and then put your code in, which makes it kind of nice and readable because inside the function, when you're writing it, you would talk about start and end, which makes sense. But when you're calling the function from outside, you would talk about from and to, which uh, is, is more natural English and, and makes more sense from a, from, a, from a readability point of view. So by having both internal and external names for the functions, you can make your code more readable. Uh, it has varags, um, which let you pass more than one or instance of a particular type to a function. So here it's the uh, what kind of well-known three-dot syntax to say this is one or more integers that are being passed to it. So in this example, I'm just calculating the maximum of the integers that were passed in. And the way you would do call that function is one, two, three, four, five, like that. So in, in that case, you don't have to pass the name of the parameter because it would be silly if you had to do numbers one, numbers two, numbers three. You'd go crazy. Um, and if you don't pass anything at all, that's an error. I said that Swift has tuples or tuples, depending on what, how you want to call them. Um, tuples are known from Python. This is a way to return more than one thing from a function. Um, so I in a language like Java, if you want to return more than one thing from a function, you'd have to wrap it up in some other type, maybe create a class or just, just for that particular purpose. Here, you can see that the return type of this function is a tuple of min and max, so I can return two things at the same time, which is kind of nice. Um, and then when I call that, um, I can fish the result out and print out result.min and result.max. So that's nice and saves you kind of bloating your type hierarchy for something that's quite simple. Uh, it has closures, like uh, which are kind of equivalent to lambdas. So here's an example. I've got an array of three integers, and I'm going to call the map function on those. Um, so what this is doing is I'm calling the map function. I'm passing a closure to the function with the curly braces. Uh, first of all, you see the closure signature, so it takes an integer and returns an integer and then the keyword in is where the body of the closure starts and so this closure just returns the number multiplied by 5 so you would get 5, 10, 15. That's a bit wordy though so another way to do the same thing is just to pass the closure without the uh, signatures and in that case uh, the compiler will infer them for you if it can. And even simpler still you can just do this. Um, so you'll notice here that the parentheses have vanished and we're just left with the curly braces. Um, if the last parameter to your function is a closure, uh, you can kind of you can do what's called trailing closure syntax. So in this case, you can omit the parentheses because you're only passing a closure. So that's nice. And $0 is shorthand for the first parameter. So if you've got two parameters, you'd, call, you'd refer to them as $0 and $1. So let's talk about how you encapsulate your code now. You've got structs. So here's a struct which has an x and y variables in, and it defines a function as well, which returns a description, uh, just saying what those are currently set to. Um, so how would you create one of these? Like this. Um, notice I haven't had to define a constructor or an initializer for this. Uh, with structs, you get a free one, which initializes each of the elements inside your struct. Um, so let's say I uh, created a new coord and assigned it to coord, and then I set coord.x to be equal to 4. So I've got, in this case, uh, 1 which is set to 2, 4, and then I change it. Um, and if I print it out, the, the original coordinate will say x equals y, x equals 4, y equals 4, as you would expect, uh, whereas new coord will say x equals 2, y equals 4. So when I did that assignment, that's not uh, giving me a reference to the same object. Uh, this is known as pass by value instead. So you, what you're actually getting is a reference to the value of it. And then when you update the new one, you g it does a copy at that point to give you a new object. So structs are passed by value. It has enumerations as well. Oh, that's a long way to the top right. Um, so here's an enumeration with three cases. 
Um, enumerations are well known. What's different about them in Swift is that you can assign what's known as an associated value to each of them. So here, two of my cases, I've got a string associated value. So what that means is I can create an approval status and say who it's, dep who it's pending on. So I in this case, I'm passing a string to that enum there. And then if I set it to something else, I can set it to approved and change what the string is. Um, what that means is that you can then switch on your enumeration and say, according to the state it's in, you can fish out what that associated value was by saying kind of let approver there. So that's uh, a really nice feature that lets you just stash something inside enumeration without having to go to all the hassle of kind of subclassing it or adding state to it, which is nice. So I said it had structs which were passed by value. It does also have classes which are passed by reference as you would expect. So here's a class which has uh, one uh, instance variable called area. Um, here I've creating an initializer which is basically a constructor for setting that up and then I've got a variable uh, here known as side length which has getters and setters uh, which is kind of nice. New value there is kind of a bit of magic. It's whatever I'm setting it to comes in as something called new value. You can give it another name if you want to. And finally in our, in our lightning language tour um, it has something called protocols, um, which are maybe kind of familiar to people who've done Java before, um, in that they're a bit like interfaces in Java. So here I've got a protocol which is uh, called describable, which is declaring one method signature. So uh, I anyone who wants to conform to that protocol would have to, in, as in the second example, struct car conforms to describable. Uh, would provide an implementation for that method. Um, so far, not very interesting. Uh, where it gets interesting is uh, with what's called protocol extensions. So here, double is a type, one of the built-in types, which comes from the standard library. So uh, what we're doing here is we're adding an extension to double to make it conform to a new protocol and then providing an implementation for that method. So this is kind of interesting that now all doubles in your program will have that description method available to them. So it's kind of letting you compose new functionality on top of the existing types without having to do things like inheritance. Um, so that's sort of kind of an interesting feature of the language. It's a bit similar to traits in Ruby, if you've, do if you've done anything like that. So if you want to get going with the language and kind of kick the tires, try it out, what can you do? Um, well, our team's created a, a website which you can visit, um, which is known as the called the IBM Swift Sandbox. Um, it's a, a bit like a REPL in that you have kind of a split screen. Um, in fact, I'll show you, why not? Uh, so here's the Swift Sandbox. If I make that bigger, maybe. Can you read that? Probably not. Not too bad. OK, so on the left hand side, you've got your code. If I just refresh it. Um, and on the right hand side, you've got your output. So you can just run the code. And there you go. Uh, what's actually happening when you're doing this is your code gets uh, packaged up, sent to the cloud, and it's actually executing on a Docker container on, on our cloud, and then the result gets sent back to your browser. So, um, so the, uh, what, what, what you're doing here is you're actually compiling your code on Linux in the cloud, executing it, and then the results come back down, which is kind of nice. Um, so we've got a few samples which you can load into the system. Here's one that just does Fibonacci, so we can do that. Um, we have various different versions of Swift you can choose. You're, of course, most likely to want the most recent version of Swift, but you can choose between different ones if you want. And the most recent thing is that we have beta support for running Swift on Linux 1, which may be something people know, know about. That's the mainframe. Um, so if you're interested, let's see if we can get this to work version. So here we have a tiny slice of an IBM mainframe <laughs> and if we execute that with any luck we'll get the same result. Yeah, so you've ever, if you ever wanted to have a play around and have a tiny tiny piece of a mainframe, there you go. Um, so to do that we've IBM's ported the Swift compiler to the S390 architecture. Okay, so that's the Swift sandbox. If you're interested in having a play around, go and go and have a try out.
And one of the nice features it's got as well is um, if you've got a little snippet of code and you want to share that with someone, you can get a permalink to that. So what we're seeing is that a lot of people are taking those links and they're dropping them into Stack Overflow or Slack or wherever, uh, sharing them. And uh, that's really great to see that uh, people are really using the tool and getting a lot of benefits out of it. Let's move on and talk about Swift on the server side, which is a, a really interesting topic. So we've spoken so far about some of the runtime characteristics of Swift. We spoke a bit about the performance, how it has low memory usage. Um, but all of this makes Swift a good fit for the server side as well, um, uh, combined with a, a good developer experience. Um, and it in doing that enables something called isomorphic development, which I'll talk a bit more about in the next slide. Um, it's also fun to work on something new. It kind of feels a bit like back in the old days when you were in Java and nothing worked yet. And <laughs> you <laughs> but isomorphic Swift code, what's, what's that? This is the idea that you could reuse code from the client side, be that iOS or whatever, um, and on the server side as well. And you would be able to uh, develop for both without having to have a separate front end and back end team who don't talk to each other as much as they ought to. Um, it's the idea that y your code can be more reusable between the front and the back end. Um, we're working on this at the moment in our team. It's it's kind of not it's not finished yet. It's work in progress. But the the go the goal is that you'll be able to define uh, REST APIs through some definition language like Swagger, for example, and then from that you'll be able to generate both the the back end and the front end um, and write both sides in Swift, which would be really cool. But what, what does it take to, to, to enable that? Well, to bring Swift to the server side, you've got to take all the things you've got on the left-hand side in your client, and you've got to have those on the right-hand side in the server side as well, so that the, the, the developer experience is consistent, and the libraries that you have on the client, you also have on the server side. Um, so a few of those libraries on the right are, are in slightly lighter blue. Um, so these are the things which weren't initially there on Linux. Um, and that we've been working to develop and enhance as, at IBM. Um, one of those is foundation, which is kind of equivalent to the class libraries. So on the, um, on the Apple platforms on the left-hand side, um, the foundation code is all still written in, in Objective-C. Um, Swift has really good interoperability with Objective-C, uh, so that works really, really well and seamlessly on those platforms. Um, but there is no, none of that Objective-C code available on the server side. Um, so we've been working in open source with Apple to uh, kind of develop those libraries in Swift itself. Another one is uh, Dispatch down the bottom there, which is the multi-core concurrency library. So that was open sourced by Apple as well at, uh, last December. And we've been porting that to Linux so that, uh, that Swift on Linux has the same concurrency story that it does on the client side. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more about dispatch, actually, because it's an interesting topic about how you exploit multi-core hardware with Swift. Um, dispatch is, um, the, the, the library itself is called libdispatch, uh, but the marketing name for it is Grand Central Dispatch. Um, and the basic idea is that you can execute your code on multi-core hardware by submitting your code to dispatch queues, which are all managed by the system. So all of these queues are first in, first out. So the idea is you put a task in on the left, it's managed by the dispatch system, eventually it's executed, and then uh, your code runs. So it's, a, it's an abstraction which doesn't involve threads. Um, so the, the three main pieces here are the queue that you're creating. So that's an abstract work container which you're going to put some work on. That could be a serial queue. In which case, all the items in the uh, n queued would be executed in order, or it could be a parallel queue. In which case, uh, the items are dequeued off the right-hand side in uh, sequential order, but they're executed simultaneously. What work can you do? Well, anything. You can just pass any Swift closure uh, through, uh, so you can call any Swift function you want to as part. Uh, as part of a uh, block that you pass to Grand Central Dispatch. Uh, and I said it's all managed by the system. So the Dispatch itself maintains a thread pool in the background. 
and then work is, as it, you might guess, dispatched onto those threads by the system. So this is a different model to some languages like Java where you explicitly create threads yourself and manage them and have to deal with mutual exclusion and lock inversion and all these kind of problems. There's a system to make this all easier for you. So here's how it actually looks. Um, you would import the dispatch library, um, create yourself a new dispatch queue and give it a label. In this case, we get serial queue. And then the method call you made is doc dot async, which says I want to execute this block of code uh, on that queue asynchronously. Um, so here I'm using that trailing closure syntax as well. So that is a method call. I'm calling the dot async method, which has one parameter, which is a closure. Um, there's also things like async after, so you can pass in a deadline and say I want to execute this one second in the future. So that's a serial queue. There are also concurrent queues as well. In that case, you pass the concurrent attributes when you're creating your dispatch queue. Um, and in that case, you get, unsurprisingly, a concurrent queue, which you can then call the async or sync method on, depending on what, on what your use case is. So you, it, you can see it's really easy for, to kind of take a block of code, throw it off to dispatch, and let dispatch work out which thread's going to run it, and you can obviously get notification back when your work's done. Um, there are additional APIs for grouping your work together. So let's say you've created a dispatch queue, which is a concurrent one. If you can then create a group as well. So uh, what you can use groups to do is to aggregate work together. So let's say you've got four things you want to execute. And once those four things have all completed, then you can go on and execute the next bit of work. So here, when you call queue.async, you can pass a group through. Um, so this is kind of uh, incrementing a count internally to say this group has been entered, does the work, and exited. And then at the end, you would do group.notify, which says once all of the items associated with this group have executed, then we can print out that all the work's done. So it's quite a flexible system for managing work, um, and we've been using it successfully in our team. What did it take to bring Grand Central Dispatch um, to Linux in Swift 3? Uh, well, we had to do a port to Linux. Um, we, we're depending on some user space modules, libp thread worker queue and libkq to provide some um, primitives that Linux operating system doesn't provide, but Mac OS does. Um, uh, also new in Swift 3, there's a, it's got a new, that API I just showed you is a new friendly API. It used to be pretty horrible to work with. Um, but the, the new API came in in Swift 3. Um, and also, the, uh, we've been working to enhance the performance of, uh, of Grand Central Dispatch as part of the Swift 3 release. So we've got all the pieces. We kind of spoke about how we've got Foundation, which is the, the class library equivalent. We've got Dispatch for the multi-core support. We've got a compiler. We can execute it on, doc on in a Docker container. We've got Linux support. So what that means is that uh, quite a number of open source projects have sprung up, which are all interested in kind of Swift on the server side and what the possibilities are and experimenting and innovating in this space, which is really interesting. So there's, if you if you go on GitHub, you'll find a whole bunch of different projects. We were all doing fantastic work on server side Swift. Um, and the one uh, of that I'm going to talk about in a moment is Kitura, which is the one that our team has created inside IBM. Uh, Kitura is a web framework written in Swift, um, but you should definitely check out all these other ones as well because they're doing fantastic stuff. Um, I said we were bringing all the APIs that we needed to Swift, um, but s doing work on the server side has very different kind of requirements, um, and and. Uh, different. You need different libraries than you would on a client side. So uh, recently, um, Apple and IBM and a few others have launched a new work group inside the Swift.org project, where this is a work group specifically for developing server-side APIs. Um, all these frameworks that I showed you on the previous slide so far have all been kind of rolling their own for core bits of functionality that you need to get work done on the server side, whether that's networking or security and encryption, or HTTP and WebSockets. Uh, up until now, everyone's been been writing their own. Um, hopefully, going forward, we're all going to work together a bit more um, and provide some of these foundational uh, technologies, which 
no one really wants to compete on, do those collaboratively uh, through an open source project and then concentrate our innovation further up the stack. All of the, so the, this, is, this is the kind of thing that we're going to be working on as part of the server API work group. Um, and all of those, uh, all of the results of this will be released as Swift packages. So I said in Swift 3, there's a new package manager for Swift. Um, so all of the, the all of the outputs from this work group will be Swift packages. Um, so we've, we've actually created another website to help people discover these Swift packages, which is called the Swift package catalog. So you can see here that it, it lets you create, share and discover Swift packages, explore the dependencies between them. Um, and you can also now log in using your GitHub ID and kind of save your favorites, that kind of thing. So if you're developing in Swift and you want to find, there must be a library out there that does, I don't know, um, YAML encoding and decoding. Um, go on package catalog, type YAML in, and if there is one, we'll find it. Um, we're crawling GitHub for all the active Swift projects which are producing Swift package manager ca packages. So I mentioned that um, we created a, a web framework that's called Kitura. Um, it's as as you might expect, it's open source on GitHub, and it runs on macOS or Linux. Um, it's inspired by Express for Node.js. So if you have any experience of backend development with Express, uh, you'll feel right at home with Kitura. It has flexible routing. You can plug middlewares which you write yourself into the request response chain and it's really easy to deploy it either locally on a machine or on, uh, on a cloud. So how would you get started with Kitura? Um, so this is kind of a bit of an introduction to Swift Package Manager as well, um, but here we go. Let's create a directory, change into it, and then you initialize a brand new Swift package. So here we're saying Swift package in it, and we're saying we want an executable. Um, if you don't say that, you get a library. But because we're writing a program, we're actually going to execute. We're going to say we need an executable. Uh, and once you've done that, that will give you kind of a basic structure. You get different. You get a few different files. Package.swift is where your package definition is. It's kind of equivalent to app.js for uh, for JavaScript. Um, main.swift is where our Swift code is going to go and then you get a test directory as well where you can put your unit tests. So inside that package.swift file that's just been created you would add Kitura as a dependency and the way that works is uh, like this. So here's some little bit of Swift code. So we're creating a package, giving it a name and then declaring its dependencies and the dependencies are defined by uh, the git URL and then also the major and minor version. And the way this works is by uh, uses semver, so semantic versioning, and it's looking at tags on the GitHub project. So we will have a 1.1 tag of Kitura on our GitHub project, and then you can depend on that, and the SPM will pull down that exact tag for you. Okay, so you've said that you're depending on Kitura. How do you actually use it? Um, so now inside your main.swift, you would create a router, and then you would define a route. So here we've got a new router and we call dot get, uh, which sets up a new route. So what this is saying is every time anyone goes to slash hello in their web browser, we will se set the HTTP response to be OK, which is 100, I think, and then send a little bit of HTML back. So that's that's kind of the basic hello world for it. You can also do JSON if you want. So here's a route called hello.json. And in that case, we would send back a little bit of JSON as well. And OK, you've created a router, you've defined a route. What else do you need to do? Um, you need an HTTP server. So you create one of those uh, and tell it which router you want to use. And then finally, you just kick off the Kitura framework called .run and off it goes. So your kind of Hello World app looks like this, which is what 10 lines of code. Um, and that's defining two routes, one of which is doing JSON as well. So it's really simple to get, at, get started out of the box. Um, once you've written your code, you need to compile it. So you do that with Swift build. 
and once you've executed Swift build, you would then just run it because it's an executable on disk. Um, and once you've done that, uh, if you go to the splash screen, uh, so the root directory, you'd see our splash. Um, hello is the root we just defined with the h1 tag, and hello.json was the JSON root we defined. So that's really nice. Um, to make it even easier to get started with Kitora, we've created a project which is a sample project. So this, the sample project depends on Kitora itself. So you can pull down Kitora sample. We even provide a make file, so all you need to do is make run, um, and that will build and run uh, your web server out of the box, which is nice. Um, there's also there's another project which is for pushing to our cloud. Bluemix has built-in support for pushing to there. Um, and we're also starting to work on some cognitive APIs with Swift. So um, you might have heard of IBM Watson, which is our cognitive computing platform. We've got some Swift APIs for that, so you can interface with, with things like uh, I think there's weather data, image processing, a few different things. So that's worth having a look at as well. Um, once you so the hello world example is really simple. Obviously, you're just defining a route returning some static HTML or JSON. Um, real apps need to talk to a backend. Um, so we've been developing drivers for common NoSQL databases. So we've got uh, drivers for Apache Cassandra, for Redis, or for Apache CatchDB. So depending on what your flavor of NoSQL is, you can easily get started with one of those. Um, so it's easy to connect your Kitora app to a backend all in Swift. You might also want to support some authentication in your app. So we have a framework in Kitura, the credentials framework. Uh, it's kind of like passport.js. Um, and we've got built-in plugins for Facebook, Google, or GitHub. So you could allow your app's users to log in using their credentials from any of those OAuth providers. Um, we also have created an end-to-end -end demo app. So I spoke earlier about this idea of isomorphic development, the idea of being able to write your client side app in Swift and your back end in Swift. Um, so what we've created is, a, is an app called Bluepick. Uh, this is an iOS app which you can download into Xcode and deploy to your, to your iPhone. Um, it's, it's a photo sharing app, I think, um, uh, kind of uh, a bit like Flickr, I suppose. Um, but, but it also has a back end which we've written in Kitura as well. So both sides of the app are written in Swift, um, so you can experiment with that, which is a really nice nice way to go. Um, another demo we've got is uh, for to-do list. So there's a, there's a website called To-Do Backend where people write kind of different to-do list apps, whether it's Ruby on Rails or Django, Python. Uh, we've got one of those for Kitura as well, so if you want to see how to write a simple backend you with kind of CRUD, semantics, create, uh, delete, update, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we've got a back end for that, so you can try that out. And we also have a, a, a desktop app for deploying to the cloud. Um, so once you've created an app, um, a Kitura app, and you want to run that on the cloud, you want to push it up to a Cloud Foundry provider, um, for example, Bluemix, you can, you can do that using our, using our app. Uh, which integrates with Xcode. So if you've got if you've got a Mac and you want to try that out, um, that would be great. And once you've used the cloud tools tool to push it up to a cloud, you then need to run it on the cloud. And so um, I think last month or a month before, we released uh, support for Swift on IBM's cloud, Bluemix. Um, so you see we've got a Swift runtime there, uh, which you can use, uh, which will run your Kitura application on top of Cloud Foundry uh, in the Bluemix platform as a service. So it's kind of a kind of an end-to-end -end story really. You can um, you can use Swift on Linux, you can use it on iOS, you can uh, create an iOS app, link it to uh, backend written in Swift as well, and you have an end-to-end -end story for pushing directly to the cloud. So that's kind of cool. What's coming next for Kitura? Well, we're still we released Kitura 1.0 last month, or maybe the month before now, um, which had uh, a whole bunch of really important and useful features. But uh, things are marching on. We're currently working on WebSocket support for Kitura, uh, 
Um, we hope to start working on HTTP2 at some point in the future. Um, currently, if you want to connect to a backend using one of our drivers, um, you have to kind of write for that specific driver. We're trying, we're thinking about ways we could abstract that away, perhaps through some kind of ORM framework. Um, we're working on performance, monitoring, clustering, all the important things people need if you're going to actually deploy this to production in a real cloud. So that's the future of Ketura. Um, what about the future of Swift on Linux itself? Um, th the implementation of Foundation is not quite complete yet. There's more work to be done there. Uh, we're continuing to work on performance for multi-core support, Lib Dispatch. Um, we want there to be a really vibrant Swift on Linux community. I think we're really getting there with that, with things like Swift running on uh, Android, Swift running on the Raspberry Pi, things like that. So that's growing all the time, which is really nice. Um, we know we need better support for IDEs at the moment. It's not quite an Xcode-only story. There are plugins for things like VS Code, Atom, Vim, if that's your poison. Um, but there's more work to be done on, on, on IDE support. Um, so I hope you found that interesting. It's uh, kind of been a quick introduction to Swift itself, um, how Swift is coming to the server, and what IBM's doing to c help make that happen. Um, if you want to find out some more, and I hope you do, we've got a developer center. So if you go to developer.ibm.com slash Swift, you can read more about what the team's doing. Um, if there's anyone in the audience who has kind of a, a mobile uh, team in their organization who might be interested in working with us, on 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 developing a Swift backend, we'd love to talk to you. Um, I'll be around afterwards, or you can tweet me. Um, but for now, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it interesting. And if anyone's got any questions, I'd be really happy to take them. I gather there's a mic just over there, um, or you could shout. <laughs>